Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. So tonight I want to talk a little bit about the perfume of the Dharma or Dharma travels. And Dharma is a word that means teachings or it means the way or the Tao. It has a lot of different meanings. Um, And I'm very happy to be back because I've been traveling and away for many Mondays. Um, And... uh, now I'm about to go and have my own retreat and sit for a part of the month of March. Um, and often on Monday nights when I've taught over these years, I'll do teachings on some of the central Buddhist principles, the foundations of mindfulness or the Four Noble Truths, or on compassion and loving kindness and forgiveness and how they work and so forth. Um, but tonight, because I've had a number of interesting Dharma encounters... Um, and interesting lessons of value um, to me or in the way that the, this unfolding of mindfulness in our culture is happening, I thought I would tell you some of the stories of this and try to weave them together with some teachings that are useful for us. Um, in one of the old Buddhist texts, um, after people had developed some deep understanding of how to live wisely, the Buddha said to them, now go forth across the world in all directions and share what has been of benefit to you, what's been good in the beginning and in the middle and the end in your own experience. In the language of the vernacular of wherever you go, share what you found to be of value so that it's for the benefit and the well-being of others. So there is an interesting thing that's happening culturally, which is a a spread of mindfulness practices and teachings in all different forms, in education and in in prison work and in in sports and in business and so forth. Um, And as I've been traveling, um, one of the first places uh, that that I went in these last six weeks or so was to spend some time um, in Hawaii, it's, it's tough, but somebody has to do it anyway, <laughs> um, visiting Ramdas in Maui. And for those of you who don't know or remember Ramdas, he was the author of Be Here Now around the late 60s and, you know, a real transformer of the culture in many ways. And he's now 81 years old, 15 years he's had, since he had that major stroke, and he's in his wheelchair, still doesn't speak so well, but... Um, his spirit is really good, and we went swimming together, and we taught together. We, it was really wonderful to connect with him. And one of the things we talked about was mortality, um, which of course happens when you're 81, but it also happens when you're 67. Um, and actually, it could happen any time, just in case you hadn't noticed. Um, but it becomes more apparent as I get older, and I start to feel the the spirit speed of life unfolding, um, and also here I was in Hawaii, or I was in Indonesia, and these places, and these worlds appear and then they disappear, um, just the way years appear and disappear, and it's really kind of uh, amazing. Um, but I'm much more conscious of it, and I guess just to set the tone, I want to read a poem that uh, I read once more once on Monday night oh, a couple months ago um, because the awareness of death, which is a central teaching in the Buddhist monasteries, is not meant to be morbid, but rather it's meant to be a reminder so that you take this day and this moment and this experience and really live it wisely and fully. So this poem from Ellen Bass. She writes, it's a poem called, If You Knew. What if you knew you'd be the last to touch someone? If you were taking tickets, for example, at the theater, tearing them and giving back the ragged stubs, 
You might take care to touch that palm, brush your fingertips along the lifeline's crease. When a man pulls his wheeled suitcase too slowly through the airport, when the car in front of me doesn't signal, when the clerk at the pharmacy won't say thank you, I don't remember they're going to die. A friend told me she'd been with her aunt. They'd just had lunch, and the waiter, a young gay man with plum black eyes, joked as he served the coffee, kissed her aunt's powdered cheeks when they left. Then they walked half a block, and her aunt dropped dead on the sidewalk. How close does the dragon's spume have to come? How wide does the crack in heaven have to split? What would people look like if we could see them as they are, soaked in honey, stung and swollen, reckless, pinned against time? And so each time I see Ramdas, I feel this gratitude because he's still here. And we're old friends from years and years and years and colleagues and I learned a lot from him, and, and here you still are, and here I still am. And there's this, this gratitude and also this sense of the preciousness of life by paying attention. We, each moment, each day then becomes more alive. So I got to Maui, with, was traveling at first with um, Wes Nisker, who also treats, uh, teaches here, um, and found out when we arrived that, Maui, that Ramdas was teaching at the Maui Mystic Festival that next day, um, uh, where everybody's named Rainbow and Stargazer and things like that. And we decided to go. And it was near Lahaina on the beach in this camp. And there are the, it was, it's whale season. So you just look out in the straits between Maui and Molokai and the whales are leaping around. And, and, and um, we went in and it was like a hippie reservation. That's what I, you know, like some... A special biodiversity thing where the hippies still live. Um, and it was amazing. It was like another era. Because um, it was 150 or 200 people with crystals and little kids and, and tie-dye shirts. And, and it was very sweet. It's like, oh, wow, this is still happening. Um, and Ramdas was brought in and sat in his wheelchair under this spreading tree by the beach with the whales in the background. And it was like he was the elder sage. And he talked about freedom and the mystery of incarnation, of how we get into this body, which we don't know, but we have it for a limited period of time. And who do you think you are? You know, one of my teachers said, wisdom says that I am nothing. And love says that I am everything. And between these two, my life flows. So he began to talk about identity and how we create identity. And in Buddhist psychology, the creation of identity is a whole mental construct. Because if I hold up my hand and I take my thumb and I feel my forefinger, the forefinger feels long in this way and the fingernail feels a certain size and I can feel it as if it's the object of my awareness. And then I can swish my attention and I become the forefinger and I feel my thumb, which is shorter and the nail maybe needs to be clipped and I can feel the different sensations of that. And now I'm the forefinger and the thumb is the object, right? And the amazing thing is that you can put attention somewhere and then say, that's me. My thoughts. Of course, they're not the thoughts you had a while ago, so my new thoughts. That's my new me. Um or my religion, or my feelings, or my views, or my politics. And my teacher, Ajahn Chah, who had practiced as a forest monk in the wilds of Laos and Thailand for many seven, eight, nine, ten years doing these great austerities, went to see the most, most highly regarded forest master of his time, Ajahn Man, and told him about all his meditation experiences and lights and samadhi and visions, and all the things he'd seen, and Ajahn Man said, you missed the point. None of those things matter. And he said, really? He said, what then? And Ajahn Man said, well, you're still looking at experience. You need to turn your attention back and ask, to whom does this happen? 
Because there's, you know, it's like the movies. You get a romantic comedy and you get a tragedy and you get a war movie and you get a documentary and all these experiences come. But who is knowing? Who was born in this body of yours? Who are you really? And when you turn back to awareness, then the instruction from Ajahn Man was, become the knowing, rest in the pure awareness, the pure consciousness that he called the one who knows, the witness to things. <clears throat> and when you, excuse me, when you rest as the witness to experience, it doesn't mean you're detached or you don't care, but it means that you remember that you're true nature is spirit that was born into this body and then you actually have a greater freedom to inhabit and to live this life but without the same fear and attachment. You remember your Buddha nature but also you can remember and write down your social security number. You kind of put the two, you honor both sides of your life. You can inhabit it but you're not limited by it. And at one point somebody asked Ramdas, not in this venue but in another place, about being Jewish and why as a you know a Jewish American guy, he'd taken these funny Hindu name and for a while these robes and became a Hindu and you know what about his bar mitzvah and his Jewish upbringing which I also had and bar mitzvah and all of that and and Ramdas like I said, well I have a lot of respect for the Jewish mystical tradition, the Kabbalah and the Hasidic tradition and all of that, and there's beautiful things I've learned from that. He said, but remember, I'm only Jewish on my parents' side. (laughs) And it's witty, you know, but there's also something really profound. You're not limited by who your parents were or by that conditioning. So he sat there and he said, who are you? You are not your body. I mean, it was little and it gets older and then it decays, it does this. That's not who you are. And there was another disabled person in a wheelchair when Rob Nuss said that. He said, hallelujah. You know, it was a beautiful moment. You are not your body. You're not your feelings. You're not, you know, all these identities. You're not your race or your religion or your gender. Yes, you are those. But you're something much deeper and truer than that. And there's a text, um, and the texts are really just descriptions of conversations or talks by the Buddha, um, where a uh, a man um, uh, named Mogarahan went to see the Buddha, and he said, I hear you you are a great sage. I have a question to ask of you. How can a person live in this world so that they are not seen by the king of death, which is really the question of how can you understand that which is timeless or deathless, beyond birth and death? And the Buddha replied, look upon this world as empty. The streams, the ever-changing streams of body, feelings, perceptions, thoughts, and consciousness as not being I or mine, Possess nothing as self, take nothing as me or mine, and you will live such that the king of death will not be able to find you. That was his instructions. So Ramdas is sitting there, you know, and talking to people, and it's unsettling, of course, this level of teaching, even though it's true, right? But it's unsettling. And somebody says, well, then how do you live? Or how do you let go of this identity? And he said, I am loving awareness. He said, that's my mantra these days. I am loving awareness. And all this stuff happens and I tend to it and care for it and so forth. But it's not who I really am. I am loving awareness. Try it, he said. You know? And so you sit in meditation and you quiet your mind a little bit as we just did and open your heart. Um, We did a video together um, and we did some online teaching. And because he has aphasia and his language is still somewhat limited, that brilliant mind that he had, poetic and brilliant and so forth, he can't use so well anymore. And what's happened is that he just dropped into his heart. 
and he looks into the camera or at me or in dialogue, and he says, I'm loving awareness. I am loving awareness. You too. And I remember when he came to our center in Massachusetts, years ago he came, used to come on retreats with Joseph Goldstein and Sharon Salzberg and myself. And the, we have this great big old Catholic monastery that we've now had for 35 years as a mindfulness retreat center. Um, and the only two stained glass windows that are left are in one of the walking rooms and there's a picture of Jesus with one of his disciples, you know, head on his shoulder, kind of they're holding each other. And then some kind of sweet picture of some saint in the picture, the window opposite. And whenever Ram Dass would come, he would do his walking meditation between those pictures. And he said, well, this is the juiciest place in the building. You know, I don't want to leave. This is where the loving part of the loving awareness is. And, and I said, well, say more about love, you know. Is it limited? I mean, you're, oh, yes, we are awareness, but what about, how does it fit with love? And he said, well, I love everything. He said, and I looked on his altar. He has this huge altar, you know, and he has all, he probably has 50 different saints. And in between the saints, he has pictures of some of the more disagreeable political figures of our time. It's really great. They're on his altar, and he bows to them, too. You can you know, pick your disagreeable political yeah. figure, right? And he says, and I love them all. In fact, and he says, and I love this house, and I love the garbage disposal, and the trash, and the chairs, and the wall, and the carpet. And he was doing this, you know, I love everything. And somebody, a filmmaker who had done a film about Ramdas, said, do you really love everything equally? He said, yes, I do. He said, how about this old stained carpet that was there in the basement? Ramdas said, I do. I love it all. And so his friend, the filmmaker, cut a piece of stained carpet and sent it to Ramdas and said, if that's really true and you love this, then you should take down the picture of your guru and put this up on your altar instead. <laughs> and Ramdas said, I did. You know, and there it was on the, on the altar along with his guru's picture, this old stained carpet. And he said, you can't limit your love. I am loving awareness. And this is the instruction from the Buddha. He says, um, put away all distraction and let your heart full of love pervade one quarter of the world and so to the second and third and fourth quarter and thus the whole world wide above, below, around, everywhere, continually pervade the world with love-filled wishes, abiding, ab abounding, sublime, beyond measure. So when somebody said to the Buddha, how can you live a happy life? He said, it's simple. Put away your distractions and love everything in every direction. Try it. See if it works. So then I came back from Hawaii, and I had a couple more adventures in the kind of Dharma travels. I went over to Berkeley Law School, um, and Berkeley Law School has now started um, the Mindfulness and in Law Initiative through Charlie Halperin, who's a faculty member there, and some other friends, and they had a couple of conferences and teachings, and I've been part of that for a time, and I was to go and do some teachings, because the legal profession, if some of you are in the legal profession, deals with conflict all the time. That's almost the name of the game is conflict, and a lot of stress and difficulty. And so they're looking at, at Berkeley for ways to use the practices of mindfulness and compassion and so forth to make the practice of law tolerable for the lawyers and maybe for everybody else as well. And so one of these conferences, there were a number of law professors and judges and you know lawyers from various parts of the country. And one of the federal judges who'd been appointed to the bench um, said um, he'd had a meditation, a mindfulness meditation practice. And when he was appointed, they told him he was to go and sit on the bench. And he said, hmm, sit. I know how to sit, you know, because he'd been sitting in meditation. And he realized that he wanted to bring the spirit of what he'd learned in his mindfulness meditation into his work as a judge. So this is the instruction he gives to the juries. 
he says, he doesn't use the word meditation, he says, I want you to listen to what will be presented in this courtroom with total attention. You may find it helpful to sit in a posture that embodies dignity and presence and to stay in touch with the feeling of your breath moving in and out of your body as you listen to the evidence. <laughs> Be aware of the tendency for your mind to jump to conclusions before all the evidence has been presented and the final arguments made. As best you can, try to suspend judgment and simply witness with your full being what is being presented in the courtroom moment by moment. If you find your attention wandering, you can always come back to your breathing or to what you're hearing over and over again if necessary. When the presentation of evidence is complete, then it will be your turn to deliberate together as a jury and come to a decision, but not before. And there was this, there was laughter, like from you, and there was also this sigh of appreciation. Oh, because when people come into the legal system, yes, they want redress, they're looking for justice, but they're also looking to be heard and understood and known about what has happened. And in fact, when um, some years ago I got a call from part of the Ninth uh, Circuit Federal Court here in, in San Francisco, and a group of the people said, can we come up and, and get some training in forgiveness practice? Because at the level that we work, the law has failed a lot of people, and maybe we could learn something else. And I know from my teachers, from Mahagosananda and Aung San Suu Kyi now in Burma, and friends with the Dalai Lama and watching him and so forth, that um, in the worst of circumstances and in the most difficulties, if you can find a way to practice with compassion and forgiveness, it can save your life and the life of others. I saw Gosananda, who was my teacher in Cambodia, 15 years he led peace walks, bringing people back to their villages that had been destroyed by the Khmer Rouge. And with every step they would chant and sing the prayers of loving kindness. Hatred never ceases by hatred, but by love alone is healed. This is the ancient and eternal law. And he did it over and over again. And he said, you can't take a bus or a pickup truck back to your village because you will be too traumatized. We're going to walk. And with every step, you're going to reclaim your land by practicing forgiveness and loving kindness again and again, or you will be taken over by the ghosts of the past. It's really beautiful. So the Ninth Circuit was asking, how do you do this, you know? And in fact, if you look at the Buddhist teachings on conflict resolution, there are the teachings um, of conflict skills. Um, one skill is called covering mud with straw, in which you take all the stuff that everybody gets stuck in, and there's a practice to cover it over and say, all right, we see that it's mud. We don't have to stick our feet in it anymore, you know? <laughs> and then there's a training called non-stubbornness. Some of us need that rel relatively frequently, right? And then there's a training called accepting the vision of the elders in which you get others to come as you would in a court and listen or in jury and say, all right, this is the best that we can understand and then you accept it. And so you start to see this universal need for both being understood and then the skills of letting go. And that's what they were exploring over there. And my daughter, who's uh, 3L, who's at the end of her training in human rights law at, at the law school at Berkeley. She's been working at the East Bay Community Clinic connected with Berkeley Law School and working with asylum seekers. And she and some of her law students and young lawyers uh, called and asked for some support dealing with um, secondary trauma because in the community law that they do, they get battered women, they get homeless people, they get people seeking asylum who would be you know, stoned to death if it's a gay guy going back to Uganda or Mayan women from a village that the military had burned or something. And they really want to stay present for these people, but they don't know what to do with the trauma of the people they see, and they, they don't know what to do with how it impacts them. And so they were all asking for the skills of mindfulness and compassion and forgiveness and release to center themselves 
in these difficult circumstances. And this was part of the theme of it. And then there was one woman I met there whose work moved me quite deeply. Um, her name is Sujata Baliga. And she started a couple of and nonprofits, one called, I think, Community Justice Works. She was born in South India into a family where there was both violence and a lot of abuse, physical abuse and sexual abuse, um, which she now talks about openly because she wants to heal it and protect people. Um, got herself educated, went to Harvard, went to law school, and decided she was going to become a prosecutor. And she was going to get those guys and lock them up in prison anywhere she could. And she became a really tough prosecutor. And it became more and more and more difficult to do it. She went back to India, not to her family, but she ended up going up to Dharamsala to listen some teachings from the Dalai Lama, feeling she needed something. And then she wrote a note asking him a question. He put notes in some days that hopefully he'll answer in the teachings about how to deal with the struggles that she had. And to her surprise, she got a note back that said, you have an audience with His Holiness Tuesday morning, come in at 11 to his palace there, to his house. So she went to see him and she bowed and she just began to weep and all the suffering of her life poured out what had happened to her and the abuse and the, you know, the violence and, and her work as a prosecutor and just all poured out and Dalai Lama listened and when she was finished, he talked to her a little bit and he said, I have a question for you. Have you had enough anger? And he looked at her and she was about to say, and he said, I know you're going to answer what you think I want to hear, right? Because I'm the Dalai Lama. <laughs> but I'm asking you genuinely, have you had enough anger? I really want you to look. And she reflected and she said, oh, the chronic migraines, the fatigue, the depression, the, the suffering of the heart as well as the body. And she thought about it for a while. She said, yes, I've had enough, enough. And she, you know, she felt understood because he's seen so much suffering. The people who are tortured in the prisons by the Chinese Communist Army still of Tibetan monks and those who immolate themselves. And he sees it all the time. And yet somehow he maintains this compassion. She said, what do I do? And he said two things. First, meditate. You have to learn to quiet your mind and practice compassion and practice mindfulness and these trainings. These will, these will help alleviate your suffering. And then the other thing you have to do is work with the perpetrators. She said her eyes got wide and she said, all right, number one, I can do. Number two, no way, no way. And so she went to a 10-day... Vipassana, Insight Meditation Retreat, she said. And she sat and she was just boiling with the suffering of her life. For days and days, her breath, her body, all the intensity of it. And then on the last day, they were doing a forgiveness, loving kindness practice. <clears throat> and she said, it was as if, if a stone lifted from my heart that had been there since I was a little girl. And all these tears came and they weren't the tears of anger anymore. They were grief and forgiveness and understanding. She said, and I realized that I just couldn't live the way I had anymore. And she began to work with perpetrators. And over the years, she's become a leader in the restorative justice movement. So she described sitting with a circle of abusers and hearing their story and then discovering when they really opened up that almost every one of them was also, she said, it wasn't these men anymore. It was a circle of abused children. It was passing from one, or working in the prison, like a friend of mine, I think she may have worked as well, in this prison in New York in Bedford Hills, the maximum security women's prison. Almost every woman in there for a violent crime um, was violated in some terrible way first. It just didn't come out of them until they couldn't do anything more. And so in restorative justice, she works in prisons and in court cases, and she brings the victims or the victim's family, if someone has been killed, through a lot of preparation together 
with the perpetrators. And they have to ask to do this. And there's a long kind of training to do it. And eventually when they come together, they tell each other their story. And the one who did it tells the story of how they ended up doing that terrible thing. And the people who lost a child or where something terrible happened tell the story of the impact of those actions. And she said, I can't describe it except to say that it's holy work, that there's something when people come together in that way and listen to each other's lives and the suffering of their lives in that way, there's something holy about it. And she was really quite remarkable. And people understand that they're not alone in their tears. And so I was very moved by what was happening at the law school and by at least these, this group of people who were interested. And then the third set of stories to tell you in this last couple of weeks is that I also went to a conference in Silicon Valley called Wisdom 2.0, um, which is a, a wedding of wisdom and um, um, technology, basically. Um, and in each of these stories, you can kind of hear the, the worlds and the ways that these teachings have been spreading. And so Wisdom 2.0, which is now it's the third year happening, um, was a conference for about 600 people. Um, and on, on the wisdom team, if you will, <laughs> there was John Kabat-Zinn and Eckhart Tolle and Roshi Joan Halifax and myself. And on the other team was Pierre Omidyar, the founder of eBay, one of the founders of Facebook, key people, founders of Zynga or from Twitter, from Google, you know, um, a really amazing body of people um, who have created a lot of the, of the social network that we are all, except for a few of you out there, almost everybody else is using these days. Um, and um, there were 600 people in the room, but there were also 200,000 people who watched it online because it's the founders of Facebook and Twitter, and so they know how to get the word out, right? <laughs> you know? And some of them are still in their 20s, these young guys or young women with, you know, sneakers and T-shirts and stuff like that, worth $5 billion or whatever, we'll leave that aside. But, um, uh, and I asked at one point, how many of you in this room have a mindfulness or a, a yoga and mindfulness practice of some kind or a spiritual practice? And almost all the hands went up. And the theme of the conference was how do we use this worldwide technology to spread well-being and compassion and understanding between people? And it wasn't completely naive, you know. Um, and there were also concerns that it can become the instrument of Big Brother, right, watching you or that our children are using it at younger ages and kind of it's wired in their nervous system. Um, but there isn't, there's no stopping it. The, the head of U.S. News and World Report, who now runs the Pew Foundation's survey things, stood up and showed, he said, you know, in December of 2011, 10% of the American population had um, tablet notebooks, like iPads. In January of 2012, 20% of Americans had tablet notebooks. It's that fast. There are so many mobile phones and devices now, almost one for every other person on the planet, everywhere. And they're being used, um, phone minutes are now being used instead of money in places in Africa and Asia and so forth. So you can go and, you know, use a number of minutes and get a, you know, a, a can of kerosene. Or you can send your minutes to your, your wife or your husband to go get some, um, you know, seed grain for, for planting or things like that. And it's really empowering people in an extraordinary way. Um, and yes, there are concerns, but at the same time, you know, there's the Arab Spring. Um, and I have a friend who's been working surreptitiously in Syria. And I sent him this line from Pablo Neruda, or the poet, where he writes, you can pick all the flowers, but you can't stop the spring. 
a beautiful line from Neruda about the life that goes on, you know, you think you're running the show and you're, you know, you get to participate and plant your particular seeds, but something so much bigger is happening. You can pick all the flowers, all the things we worry about, but there's some life force that is who we are, that's renewing itself again and again. And he took that and he sent it all around to the activists in Syria so that they wouldn't give up hope in some way, you know, even if many of them are dying you can't stop the spring. So, um, there we were, you know, and the presentations, the wisdom part, you know, you're getting tonight in different ways, so we won't talk about that part. But the, 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 the part from the, from the technological community was really interesting. Um, for example, Padma Shri Warrior, who is the CTO for Cisco, um, stood up and spoke and she said, I have a $32 billion annual budget and I oversee uh, 25,000 engineers in, you know, and she said, and if I didn't meditate every morning, I couldn't do it. She talked about her meditation practice and how it led her to be able to be decisive, which you need to do in her role. She said, I'm, I'm known for making decisions, but first, because I practice mindfulness, I listen really carefully. And then when I make a decision, I also explain so that because everybody's coming with their ideas and what they want to do, what we should do. And so there's a kind of conflict in it. After I make a decision, because I've paid attention, I can explain to them what was the process that led to that decision so they still feel respected. She said, and that's how I do mindful leadership. And it was really beautiful. You know, or this man, Hector, from England, who created a, a who came up to me, who created a, um, an app and an online tool called Stillness Buddy, 3030, <laughs> right? So that if you, if you get Stillness Buddy, every 30 minutes your computer stops for 30 seconds. <laughs> and whosoever pictures you've chosen, the Dalai Lama or Thich Nhat Hanh or Pema Chodron, appears on your screen and gives you a 30 second meditation and then your program continues, you know. And I listened and I said, this is really good stuff, you know, we need this. So here from the Dhammapada, Better than a hundred years of ignorance is one day spent in mindfulness, waking up. Better than a hundred years in aimlessness is one day spent in awakening. Better to live one day seeing how all things arise and pass away. Better to live one hour seeing the freedom of the way. Better to live one moment in the moment of the peace that follows the way. And so, you know, this is the sacred pause. There you are in the middle of your computer or whatever you're doing, and all of a sudden there's the Dalai Lama or Aung San Suu Kyi saying, all right, now take a breath, remember, find some space, I am loving awareness, you know, and then go back to that, you know, task that you do. And it was beautiful. Um, Congressman Tim Ryan from Ohio was there. He just wrote a book, Mindful Nation, because he's working in Congress to try and get it in education around schools and so forth. The founders, one of the founders of Facebook, who has a new company, um, Asana, that they're trying to make a mindful corporation as best they can. Really interesting stuff. But my favorites were, were a couple of people. One was Premal Shah, who... Um, has, is the, in, the head of uh, a site called Kiva. And I think he'd been one of the PayPal founders, um, but then he decided, he said, I didn't want a life of just um, activity and accomplishment, I wanted a life of meaning. So Kiva is a website um, for generosity and you go on it and there's a world map and you click on a continent and then a country and pretty soon pictures start to pop up where you can do microloans to a particular person. And there's Mrs. Botswana, and it shows her and the cow she hopes to buy if you will lend her $140, you know. And if you're lucky and you do that, later on you get a picture back in your email of Mrs. Botswana, the cow, and the calf that was born. And you go, yay, you know, it worked. Or, or there's, you know, Mr. Mendoza who wants a sewing machine in Guatemala and is starting this little 
you know, cloth sewing business or whatever, and you can contribute. And part of what makes Kiva so beautiful is that it's not, okay, I'm giving to Latin America or Africa or wherever it is, our inner cities or wherever you think, um, but you're giving to Mr. Mendoza or Mrs. Botswana. And as, as Zen Master Dogen said, to be enlightened is to become intimate. To become intimate with your own breath and body, to become intimate with this dance of birth and death, not to be afraid of it, and to become intimate with one another. Um, a few years ago, Bill Moyers was uh, doing a television show um, that he wanted to do on the hospice movement and on, uh, particularly on conscious death um, that he called uh, On Our Own Terms, where people could die at home. Um, but he was worried about his production crew because it was mostly young camera people and sound people and so forth like that, mostly who had not been in the presence of people dying. So he asked Frank Ostaseski and friends from Zen Center Hospice and Spirit Rock to meet with his crew and try to help them prepare for being in the homes of and filming people who were dying. And he thought, well, they would teach them to meditate, but that's not what, what they did. Franco Frank came in, and there, there had been a brilliant photographer at Zen Center Hospice who'd taken these black and white photos of the various people who'd come to the hospice or who'd been served in their home um, in the last weeks of their life. And he brought in the pictures, and he talked about what it meant to be with someone who was dying because you can't help them in the ordinary way. They don't need something um, um, except your presence or your love. Really, I mean, what matters in the end is, did you love well? Or, uh, you can't go in with an agenda because they'll die the way they're... It's their life and it's their death. So you show up with a kind of beginner's mind in the presence. And he said, so you're going to... It's like the, the, you know, the gate between the worlds opens when you're in the presence of death. Um, and he said, so here, let me help you understand. And he passed out these photos and there were big 8 by 12 photos, and gave one to each person to look into the face and the eyes of someone who had died recently through the Zen Center Hospice. And they sat, that was their meditation, to sit with the photos. And then after a little while, he asked them to reflect about it, and then they were going to pass the photo to the person next to them and get another photo. Well, at that point, nobody wanted to let go of their picture because they'd all fallen in love with the person whose photo was in their lap. And they had made that connection that comes when you see with those kind of eyes. And so this is really the, the mystery of intimacy that Dogen talked about. To be awakened is to be intimate. And what uh, Pramal and I talked about is you know how beautiful it is that you do kiva and you see a particular person and you can give your offering to and often get some feedback. But what would it be like on the thank you page, which they do, um, of giving some teachings about, for example, the, there's a Buddhist teachings on the, the three kinds of joy that come with a generous act. The joy of giving itself, the joy of the blessing of knowing that other person's happiness, and the joy of reflecting on that benefit, not just giving it, but letting yourself reflecting, which means that you actually feel it more deeply. And then there are practices to look for moments where somebody's being generous, somebody opens the door for someone, someone picks something up for someone. You do that through the day. Maybe you look for three or four times in the day and you start to tune yourself to generosity. And modern neuroscience says that it's not just the act of giving, that changes the ner nervous system, but it's the appreciation of the act, the feeling of it. And if you have the act combined with attention to how it feels, then it lights up all these other parts of your brain and your nervous system, and it kind of reinforces it. And you go, oh, this is great. Let me do this again. So the verses of the Buddha begins, mind is the forerunner of all things, 
with our thoughts and intentions we create our world. Speak or act with an impure mind or heart, and trouble will follow you as the wheel follows the ox that draws the cart. Mind and heart is the forerunner of all things. All that arises comes out of our intentions. Speak or act with a pure heart and mind, and happiness will follow you as closely as your shadow, unshakable. And so we talked about what teachings we could offer just for the fun of it. You know, click here if you want to enjoy this giving even more, you know, or something like that. It was really great. And the work that he's doing is just beautiful. And then there was a guy named Arturo Behar, who is um, the, I don't know, the chief engineering officer or chief technology officer for Facebook. Um, And so he's in charge of both the engineering for it, but also he's in charge of relations with all the people that use Facebook, um, which includes um, complaints. That's one of his departments. And he said, we have 800 million users So you can imagine it doesn't take very long to get a million complaints, right? Think about that. You know, you you got some complaints complaints in your life. How about a million of them? (laughs) And he said, ordinarily, um, ordinarily, a corporation just has a policy, right? If the complaints come and they're technical, it's pretty easy. We send them to the engineers and they fix it. And that's pretty straightforward. He said, but I began to notice that most of the complaints were interpersonal and there were conflict between people. You posted that picture and I don't look good in that picture. I want you to take it down. Or you posted that picture and I'm with my mistress, you know, and I really want you to take that down. (laughs) Or you posted that picture, you know, and my kid's in it and I want to, you know, it's my kid and I want to decide which pictures of my kids go up and so forth. And he realized that rather than sending them some kind of mechanical policy, which they have, and it says if there's something lewd or lascivious or illegal, let us know and we'll take it down, but that that really wasn't helpful to people. So he said, I realize they have to talk to each other. So he changed the site and they have a form. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't break the law or do something where Facebook promises that we'll take it down because it's the wrong, wrong thing. He says, what we would like you to do is to contact that person directly. Now, um, he said, when you contact them, it would be helpful if you tell them, um, why you're contacting them, um, and how it felt to see what your experience was when you saw that which they posted. But then he thought, well, people don't know what they feel. So he put like smiley face and sad face and those little icons. And then he had a little thing underneath. Here are some things you might have felt. Embarrassed, you know, um, upset, betrayed, worried, anxious, and so forth, so that people would have that. And he said, and then you might tell them why you're, why you're contacting them, what motivated you to do it. And then to complete this, you might also think of asking them a question or two, such as, what made you post it? What was your intention in doing this? Um, because often somebody's intention is they think that it's a funny picture, or they think you look good, or there wasn't a malevolent intention most of the time at all. He said, and in 85% of the time, as they've tried that, people just take the picture down and once there's some communication. And he said, so I'm beginning to realize, and he's also a Dharma practitioner, that I have the opportunity to teach um, mindfulness of feelings, emotional intelligence, and conflict resolution skills to 800 million people. (laughs) You know, and that was pretty cool. So yes, we live in troubled times, and um, it's very clear that outer technology is not going to solve our problems alone. No amount of wired world and no amount of nanotechnology and biotechnology and and computers and all of this stuff is going to stop continuing warfare. I mean, here we're rattling the drums of war again in this crazy way about Iran. Isn't two wars in the Middle East enough? You know, come on. Um, And 
no amount of technology is going to stop environmental destruction or continuing racism and tribalism. It is going to require a transformation of consciousness. We are actually going to have to see one another in new ways and live in different ways on this earth with so, so many of us. Um, and I found this conference to be really hopeful. I hope you can hear that, that here are these people creating this world um, that's affecting so many people, at least this subgroup of them, and really interested in how we can use this to develop respect among people, to develop connection and compassion. We talk, some of us, about making a special site. I was also talking with one of the premier game designers of the world um, about making a site for returning vets which included some games, because a lot of them are young and play online games, the majority do, <clears throat> but that has <clears throat> storytelling um, and myths about warriors coming back, that has uh, um, rooms where combat vets can talk to one another and tell their stories in the ways that you need to and that you can't often tell even to your family, um, that has uh, trauma and healing work that you can do some online and resources where you can find it and really instructs people in, in the practices of trauma work and healing work and mindfulness and compassion um, and, and that offers this um, to, uh, we're not, you know, like vet book, like Facebook, something where people can come back and it's just part of an offering. We'll see what comes of it, but, but I hope something will come. And so there are these very beautiful and powerful seeds of consciousness in law or in technology or in business or in medicine or in education, mindful schools, and so forth. But they all grow out of what we did tonight. I mean, here we came together and sat for that 30 or 35 minutes, coming back to sense the life breath in our bodies, to rest in awareness, to be loving awareness, as Ramda says, and to feel the sadness and loss and grief, the measure of sorrows that we carry, and to feel the beauty and preciousness of life, and somehow to take our seat as the Buddha, as the awakened one, as the one who knows, in the midst of all of the dance of our life so that we can respond, so that we can engage with the kind of intimacy and connection that is both centered and strong in one way and also truly present. Um, and this is the game. You know? Otherwise you're lost, otherwise it's just reactivity and automatic pilot. But it's too late for you. This is the problem. <laughs> Once you start to wake up, what are you going to do? Go back and cultivate more greed and anger and hatred and delusion? You know, it's too late. You started and now something inside you knows that that's not the way to go and it's not who you are. The passage from the Dhammapada as the bee gathers pollen from the blossoms, creating honey without harming a single thing. So does the wise one move through the blossoms of the world, creating that which is beautiful, um, creating blessings and, and harming none. Um, and to live that to whatever extent we can for our own happiness and for the well-being of others requires that we each find our way to quiet ourselves, to listen to the one who knows, to the still, small voice, to the place of wisdom. It means walking in the mountains and walking by the ocean and listening to music and being with your lovers and all of those things that kind of bring you back to the love of life. But it also means stopping. You know, get your stillness buddy, whatever form it comes in. <laughs> Every 30 minutes, here's the Dalai Lama. Hey, you know, remember. <laughs> and open to vastness because there is a silence that surrounds us and all things 
that's always here, that we long for in the midst of all the chaos, that we fear, but also that we long for so deeply. And to sit is allow is to allow yourself to open to this vast perspective, this mystery of incarnation, because you're here only for a short while, too short for witnessing all the marvels of it, it's said. Um, and then there comes a kind of joy, this again from the Buddha, where he says as an instruction, live in joy in love, even among those who hate. Live in joy in health, even among the afflicted. Live in joy in peace, even among the troubled. Look within, be still, free from fear and confusion. Know the sweet joy of living in the way. And it's really an invitation to us to remember, um, and in all these ways, in all these dimensions, to remember this loving awareness. I am loving awareness. To remember that the small sense of self is not who you really are. Mm -hmm.